We are Things I Found Online, coming to you from Troubled Times with Health. Our children are watching and listening and experiencing our quarantine and our turbulence. How can you better parent through these trying experiences and come out on the other side stronger and healthier? I'm Jamie Alcroft. Joining us is parenting coach Catherine Salzberg, along with fantastic parents Linda Brown, James Chanzer, and our own producer Dina Friedman, plus a man who was almost fully raised by parents, Danny Mann, and our host Louise Palenka. Louise, you, Jamie. I'm a work in progress. My mother is not about to give up. Um, I too <laughs> celebrate the heroic efforts of my own parents. In my opinion, the most important thing a human can do is raise a child relentlessly. Parents are making on the fly, in motion decisions regarding what to say, how to say it, what to allow, how to react, how to explain, policy, implementation, chore wheels, etc. all of which impact the heart and soul and mind of a developing person. That is difficult enough when things are normal. Things are not normal. Jamie, Dina, Danny, how are we explaining our current reality to kids and young people? How are you doing it in your lives? Wow. No, you have to be as honest as you can be. And I don't mean to qualify it with as you can be. You just have to be honest. You have to tell them what's happening. I think the words that you choose are very important. I hope uh, Catherine would agree with me on that. Uh, it's, uh, yeah, I think the words that you choose are important. You say people are not uh, going to put up with injustice anymore. And injustice means when things aren't fair and you bring it down to, to their, their culture, their current culture, whatever age they're at. My kids are all grown up now, so it's, it's a different thing. But that's how I help them go through the riots when the riots of 92 happened. I mean, you just tell them what's happening. You tell them the truth. 9-11, you tell them what's happening. You tell them the truth as you know it. And, uh, and just you do it gently. How about you, Dina? Yeah, I completely agree about being honest. I think as a parent, you have a natural instinct to protect your kids from things that you deem painful or difficult and topics that are not easy to talk about. Um, but I don't think that that's the right way to go in this situation. I think you have to be honest with your kids and explain it to them and answer any questions they might have and do that to the best of your ability. I just want to read a couple of um, perspectives that I got from two people that I know that are parents. The first person, her name is Sarah. She says, Today, I used words with my four and seven-year-old kids I never thought I'd be using in a conversation. Words like murder and racism and brutality. I felt it was important for them to not, not see color, but to see color and to see that there's a whole race of people who are coming from a lifetime of struggles and pain. I, took, I told them a white police officer murdered a man of color by kneeling on his neck for almost nine minutes until he died. My seven-year-old asked, but the police officer went right to jail, right? And I explained to him that he didn't. The police officer killed someone and wasn't put into custody for a few days after that. Only after people of all colors took to the streets to demand justice. My seven-year-old said, he should have gone straight to jail. He can't do that. Even my seven-year-old had more common sense than grown adult. Well, you still have to explain to your child that there is a criminal justice system and there is a process. As heinous as the crime, we don't lynch people. That We don't have a vigilante squad go and get someone and, and hang them from a tree. We, we go through a process when bad, pe when bad things happen to Right. innocent people so I, I hope that stuff came up earlier in the day that's not the stuff you want to read them as a bedtime story <laughs> and I don't be I'm being glib but I'm also being like I think that's a key yeah thing I mean as look to, there's as to, as to when you meet this information out to kids right I mean the, I don't think that there's any like ideal time to have this conversation I think that as a parent you know you want your child to be 
you know, in a decent mood, in a good mental space where you can sit down and you know, like, you know, when your kid is cranky, you know, when your kid is like too distracted um, and you know, when they're in a receptive place where they're going to listen to what you have to say and take something from it. And it's not like I've had lengthy conversations with Ryder where I know he didn't understand a lot of it, but I wanted to kind of start planting those seeds. Well, the best time to uh, explain something to a child is when he has asked the question. Right. That is when they are the most receptive to learning. So, right, of course. Uh, we're going to welcome Catherine Salzberg, frequent and valued guest. Thank you. And exactly the woman for this moment. Catherine Salzberg is a CLPC certified leadership parent coach, personally trained and certified by, jo by John Rosamond. She is inspired to help moms and dads learn how to be both loving and effective parents. So let's get into this, Catherine. What are you hearing from parents and what issues are they particularly needing to address in this difficult time? Well, you know, just to dovetail on what you just said, I would never tell a four and a seven-year-old voluntarily. I would never recommend that, you know. <laughs> are you also telling them about uh, everything else that's adult as well, you know, are you talking about your taxes, you're talking about your corporate, you know, are you, <laughs> there's this, I, 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 I understand the why behind this, but to just cut to the chase, we feel a need to what really burden children when they're not asking. We, we have the TV on all day. Anxiety is one of the most contagious emotions out there. You know, I had a mom say to me, I was explaining to my daughter, so was she asking you, 12 years old? No, 12, so not a little child anymore. But she said, my daughter's very anxious. And it was clear that the daughter wasn't anxious. I, I don't talk to kids, I just talk to the parents. But it was the mom's anxiety and this pressure that she needs to make this child understand, I don't want my kid, God forbid, my kid, or heaven forbid, or Darwin forbid, that my kid grows up to be a racist. There's a lot of anxiety. I have to tell you with the parents that I coach, I want to make sure that everything, the, the ducks are in a row and that's a very different freight train running through somebody then, you know what, let me just calmly tell you what's going on in the world if you ask me. Mm -hmm. I'm going to so now that, have a dream tonight about ducks on a freight train. So well, my, four, what, my, four year old, <laughs> my four year old does my taxes. So we, yeah. so, <laughs> oh, I, does he, I'm with them too. But, but I, I, Kate, yeah, but Kate yeah. um, mm -hmm. before, before w right now we're very preoccupied by the, the protesting and what's yes. happening in the streets. But yes. cut to a week ago, children haven't been in their normal lives for, for three months. And so what, right. what types right. of questions are you getting around that or what types of issues within families? Because this is mm -hmm. very experimental. Well, right now, you know, I think every day about, and I think a lot of us do, and uh, especially as a parent coach, and I'm sure I, any, I'm not a mental health professional. I'm a, I'm, I try to help people, hopefully have, you know, better mental health by having well-behaved kids and getting parents to be more relaxed. But just worried about what's going on in homes right now. You know, there's, is there abuse happening? I mean, I think there is abuse happening, and that's, that, that's off topic. To answer your question very directly, the, what's going on with the parents that I speak with is there's, you know, um, it's a boundary issue. So if you, if you don't know how to draw any boundaries when there's no pandemic, you don't, you're certainly not gonna be able to draw them when there, when there is one. And what I mean by boundaries, just um, a parent getting a break, you know, just saying, I, I, I need five minutes to myself. And parents today, especially moms, don't really feel like they have a right to take a break or to have five minutes to themselves. It's gonna damage their kids' self-esteem or, they're, or psychologically they'll be damaged. And so there's parents that call me and say, how can I just get a break? You know, So I'll give them very concrete ways to take a break, things they can do today to take a break. The other thing is that parents think their kids are anxious. And I'm, I'm not saying there's not anxious kids, of course there are. But a lot of 12 year olds and eight year olds are, like it's really cool to be at home. They're on the Xbox most of the time anyway. They're on YouTube all day long. Or helping you know, out, so, or helping out on Daddy's talk show. <laughs> or help, whatever they're doing. But I, I think 
you know, what parents want to know from me is how can I get my kids off the computer for five minutes even? That's what they ask me. How can I get them to do anything around the house like a chore, you know? And the number one, the number one, uh, I think, anxiety producing, uh, the number one thing that's causing the most anxiety has been Zoom school. What if my kid isn't doing well? They're not paying attention to the teacher. They're off. They're distracted. So you have a lot of parents micromanaging their kids at the computer, and that causes kids a lot of anxiety. Most of this, the kids are doing, I think, pretty much just fine. Well, isn't, isn't micromanagement of kids a huge deal nowadays, regardless? Take the pandemic and this Absolutely. Kind of way. I mean, That's the, correct. The helicopter yes. moms, the micromanagement of correct. allowing yeah. kids some buffer time to just be yeah. kids. Right. So there's, uh, and micromanagement, you know, some parents will ask me, what is that? Can you give me an example? What is micromanagement? Well, micromanagement is, are you looking at the computer, paying attention to the teacher? Are you, are you looking at the teacher? I saw that you were looking at a YouTube. Why are you looking at a YouTube? I said, that's micromanagement. The other thing is, and then you have, then you have screaming. I have parents that will say, how do I stop screaming? Because when you have parents that can't go anywhere, maybe you have a marriage that's already on the rocks to begin with. You're not on the same page. Forget even, you're not even in the same book as a parent. You know, yes. forget the same page. Try a right? pillow over your mouth. Well, but there's a lot of, you know, when a parent, and it's the last thing I'll say on this, I'd love to hear from you. When a parent doesn't know how to just, isn't clear with their kids, meaning doesn't know how to say or feel they have a right to say, it's time to turn the Xbox off now. But when parents are going, you know, I think you really should turn the Xbox off. Okay, are you okay to turn the Xbox off? Are you anxious about what's going on in the world right now? Do you need that a little bit? Five more minutes, you want five more minutes? Okay. And then the parent turns around and goes, turn it off. This is what's happening. If you really want to know what's happening, that's what's happening. And then the parent feels guilty and then the kid's on it. For, take, look at porn in your room. I know you're eight. It's okay. Just, I just want you to love me. That's what's going on right now with my clients. Wow. So there's a lot of guilt-fueled parenting because yeah. parents feel somehow responsible for the pandemic and responsible for what is this doing to my child's psyche. She only gets this one childhood and she's missing a key learn, a, she's missing a key year of learning. And then what do I, and now it's my responsibility to make sure you know, that all of those, you know, synapses are, 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 finding each other, whatever synapses need to do, in other, in other words, when a child <laughs> breaks out. Like, you know, it's this <laughs> panicky feeling that, oh, yeah. uh, you know, she's not socializing and she, did, she missed this, you know, fractions. She's never going to understand fractions. And ah, so <laughs> that's exactly, that's exactly it. My, my kid, I can't have him go turn off the Xbox because he doesn't have any connection with anyone. Why don't you turn the Xbox off and give them some connection by turning off your devices at the dinner table? There's yeah. your connection. And that's the best connection you can have right now. So, Kate, my question is, what do you do for yourself when you get off of these calls to come back to zero and not be frantic like you're pretending to be right now? I leave my son on his Xbox and I look at Facebook. That's oh. what I do. And no, scream. I don't do that. And, no, you're, and I scream. You're asking me what, are you seriously asking me what I do as a parent? You mean her? No, yeah, like, like I'm saying, just to, when you come off of six or seven calls like that, oh. where you're like, oh my God, like. Oh, I, no, I, I, I coach the same way that I want parents to parent. Oh. And what I mean by that is I don't want parents to be thrown off balance by their children. Because children need parents who know exactly where they stand. And they need parents who are very relaxed or who, or who are acting relaxed. So, you know, the best thing that I can impart to mom or dad is one is I do have parents, let's say they're in support groups, 12 step groups. And I say, you have to keep that going. Whatever you were doing outside for your self care, you need to keep that going. It's very important. But the thing, the, the forget your kids doing well in school, even I'm not saying it's not important, but the better for you to be relaxed and look at your kid and go, you know what, you're going to do just fine. Enjoy your classes to the best of your ability. I have complete faith in you that you're going to just, you're going to do fine. Yeah. Also, I, you know, I think, you know, a thing to maybe remind parents is that children go on learning whether or not they're in school or in this structure. Their brain is continuing to observe the world and make connections and, 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 and develop reason and develop a point of view. Mm -hmm. 
and develop abstract thinking, that's not stopping. You haven't put them in a bunker underground to, to wait out the Holocaust, you know? Um, they're, they're still amongst us. So it's, yeah. don't feel so much, go ahead, Jamie, you had something. I was gonna say, don't feel so much pressure that it's all on you. They're still learning. Yeah, I, I was just gonna say, consider it a semester off. Uh, you know, if, if I had children that were in school right now, that were that age, that's, that's how I would do it because I have time to experience things with them and we can still get in the car and go someplace and stand out in the middle of the field. We can go yeah. to see the poppies, stand out in the middle of the field. You don't yeah. have to stand and boot the people. You can go to, you know, a remote somewhere and, and have adventures and, and, uh, just or have adventures around the house just you know it's a semester off period just and the kids like you said louise are going to learn 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 despite what we try to do and true story a friend of mine stan ostern did live three years underground in a bunker during the holocaust wow he's a doctor so wow. your kids your kids are gonna you're gonna they're gonna be okay and I think what's more important than like what, what knowledge is actually entering their head is, do they feel safe? Do they feel loved? Do they feel connected? Do they feel a sense of purpose? Are they a contributing member to the household that makes them feel good at the end of the day? Like they, they did something productive or positive. Mm -hmm. That's, I think, what, what you should be focusing on. In fact, well, you could do I, my job. Wait, there you go. That's why we filled, made out this 200 question questionnaire for the kids to fill out. And we're going to review this at the end of the day. Yeah. I mean, um, now let's go straight to our, our Dina cam. Now, Dina, you know, you are live, you know, you are um, embedded <laughs> with the Friedman household. Can you <laughs> give us, yes. Can you give us a report or how, how are things going on the ground there? I mean, things could be better. I'm not going to lie. Um, but I think we're doing okay. So what, so I wish that I could just tell Ryder, like you don't have to do any school for the rest of the year, but there is a basic minimum requirement that he has to fulfill in order to like go on to fourth grade. Um, oh, there's a basic minimum requirement you have to fulfill. Well, that, that Ryder has to fulfill that I have to like make him do. He's pushing back like nobody's business. Like he does not, he has never been able to wrap his mind around the fact that he has to do school, even though he's home. Like, he thinks, I'm home, school is canceled, why do I have to do work? Oh. And I hate making him do things. I'm like, a, I'm a permissive parent because I, I know the feeling, like, I grew up in a very strict household, and I know how awful it feels to, to feel that powerlessness, that, like, for some reason, adults are telling me to do something. I don't know why. I don't like it. And I hate that I'm being forced to do it. Um, so I know, Catherine, you, whenever we talk to you, um, we have a discussion about kind of involving the child and the family with like, chores and making them feel like they're a part of the family, like kind of what the, uh, what the family, like basic, like, how, what am I trying to say? Um, like meeting the needs of the family, right? Um, and I'm kind of wondering what I can do to kind of make him feel like we're all like making our contribution. Like his contribution might be just to do his work. Um, it could also be like a certain chore or something, but I kind of want to make him feel like he's not being forced to do something. He's doing like we all have our little part to do, and just this is like his part. Uh, thank you. First of all, I really appreciate your sensitivity, you know, to your son and that you grew up in authoritarian, right? Authoritarian mm -hmm. home. Yeah. And we've, you know, you said something. I don't want him to feel to be forced. Writers, how old? Is he twelve or? He's nine. He just turned oh, nine. He's, he's nine. Yeah, he's, he's thirty-two. So, That's the problem. I was so a you very would young like, mom. Yeah. So if I heard, I just want to make sure that I heard you correctly. That you want him to not feel like he's forced. You want him to make some contribution. Should he have a chore? Should school just be his chore? No. 
Right. Yeah, is that what you what you want yeah. to do? Yeah. You know, parents today are afraid to force kids or to draw boundaries. And your that fear is really about Dina, right? It's like right. I'm afraid. I don't want so that's not that's not so much about what writer needs though. Mm -hmm. And writer needs what I how what I would suggest. And, and look, this isn't, you know, I'm not the shock coach or, you know, in 30 seconds, I'm just going to infuse you with exactly what you need to do. <laughs> but, you know, one is that the more parents micromanage a kid's homework, the more parents are on a kid about work. And this has been, this is proven, by the way, the less effective kids are because we unwittingly send children the message. I don't believe in you. That's why I'm always on you. And I know that you want to send right of the message. I believe in you. So I would first say, let homework be between writer and his teachers. It is not your job to teach him. It is their job. And the more that you sit back and relax, you know, there's the ABCs of homework. I love the ABCs of homework. A stands for all by myself. B stands for back off mom. And C stands for a cutoff time. Well, that was I can, I can send you, thank you. I could send you <laughs> something on that. But you know, the other thing is I would recommend writer has regular chores and you do need to insist that a kid does chores. I know we don't like the word today. Well, responsibilities. But you know what? We do have to, as parents, insist. He's not going to wake up and go, Mom, you know what? I'm so excited that I get to mop the floor. I feel like I'm making a contribution. Thank you. He's not going he's, he, he, he's to like anything you tell him to do. Right, yeah. So, but he needs to make a contribution and not just be a consumer, which is what kids generally are today. They're consumer, consumers and they want to make a contribution, but they're not going to wake up on their own and go, you know, let me, let me wash those windows and paint the house. So I recommend that he would have regular chores. If you want to ensure better achievement in the school year, by the way, give kids chores. Watch what happens when they take personal responsibility for a chore. Right. It's not about an A. It's not about a trophy. It's about, you know, I did a really good job on the bathroom floor. I'm capable. So you, you posted something very interesting on, on Facebook, Dina. You, you, were, you posted something to the effect of Ryder wanted you to, to cook him something and you, you had been cooking, you know, for him. And he's, you said, I, I cook for you all the time. And he said, no, you don't. You, 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 <laughs> you sit over there and play Sudoku. <laughs> and like your kid is so willful and he's watching everything and using yeah, it. And I feel like it's none of his business when you play Sudoku because he's got a roof over his head and a bed to sleep in and food in his tummy. And I just feel like he's way out of bounds when he's saying, you know, he's insinuating that you can't play Sudoku. I, I just don't know if Coach Kate can help us. How do we get back to where he understands I'm the kid? Right. Right. Are we, are we about to vote Ryder off the island? <laughs> it's a one-kid household. That's why, you know what I mean? Like, it's a one-kid household. Yeah. Those are interesting. Sorry. And this is something that Dr. Kate, she has a lot to say about um, the idea of not being, like, you're not your kid's buddy, right? You're not, like, best friends with your kid. You're a parent, and you need to kind of occupy that role. This is, by the way, do you, want me to, do you want me to respond to that, Louise? I don't want to dominate the whole. Yeah, yes, yes. Yes, please. I, I would. Because I know. <clears throat> yeah, you bring up a good point. Dina's job is really hard. And, and it's not the problems that Dina's having are the, they're ubiquitous. So, and it's really simple to change this, by the way. But it's, it's not easy, right? So, you know, simple but not easy. You've heard that before. And right. the reason it's not simple. Well, we're in a, in, a, um, in a pattern now, right? Like, right. I've already started his... But, but that's okay. You know, as a parent, just like we all have a right to change course. Yeah. And we set a great example for our kids when we, when we say, you know what, this wasn't, this wasn't in your best interest. So today's parents, the reason you have that power struggle, by the way, is that we, we're, we're, raising, we're, we're not so much focused on raising kids. We're focused on making them happy and making them feel good all the time. So because the parenting paradigm shift a while back, it went from anything traditional is horrible. And a lot of it, let's, okay, a lot of it's horrible, but come on, a lot of it was pretty good. Parents, you know, I say this a lot, 
women did not have a, a lot to do in the 50s, let's say in the workplace, but they had no problem telling their child, don't, don't look at, don't speak to me like that. And they weren't all flogging their kids, you know? So this just happened, it's, again, everything comes down to boundaries and it, it all emanates from you, Dina. So when you decide, no pressure. That, well, you know something, it just, it's a practice like anything else. Right. Wake up in the morning and you practice, you know, cooking or practice yoga, whatever you're practicing. You go, you know what? I'm going to pull the plug on the power struggle. I tell parents one thing, do one thing. So when your kid says, you don't cook for me and you turn around and defend yourself, <laughs> this is not your spouse, it's your kid. So you now have put your child in a position to argue with you because you open the door. Every parent, but most of them will say to me, my kid's argumentative. I say, nah. There's just a parent who's opening the door to the argument, generally speaking. So if he says, you know, you never cook for me, eh? or, or you're not cooking what I want. What was it? What did he say exactly again? You're not. Well, he's just like a smart mouth. So yeah. he was saying, um, I was like writer and I was kind of like half joking. I'm like, I feel like all I do all day is cook meals for you because since he's home all the time, I just do a lot more cooking. Um, and he said, mom, that's not all you do. You also, and he listed like you do Sudoku, you, um, watch ASMR videos and like, and, like he just like listed the things that I do. And then I was like, well, what about, and so we're having this like back and forth and it's like kind of, it is kind of playful. Like, I'm like, well, what about like, I work and I homeschool you. And he just kind of was like, whatever. But it's kind of like, where do you draw the line, right? Between like being playful and being yeah. like, so I can, I can respect can my authority. <laughs> so you're not going to have him. He's not going to respect your authority. It's not going to happen. I'm going to let you know that right now. Okay. I believe you. you I, I'm just, I'm, I'm sorry. That's really painful, but you have a nine year old that you're trying to reason with and defend yourself against. You have put him in the position. It is not your fault, by the way. And it wasn't my fault with my older kids. It was what I was told by parenting experts who have had, as I say, way more schooling than I ever will. And a lot of them have wonderful things to say. Be empathic, be empathic, but don't let your child talk to you like that. But no one, none of them tell you what to do about that. Hey, Kate, a question kind of for you yes. and Dina is, is yeah. what I haven't heard discussed here at all is the balance between the father and the mother with the kid. And I, Dina, I don't know your whole situation, but mm -hmm. it, in, it, in, the, in the parents that you talk to, and maybe in Dina's case, there's a yeah. certain amount, I know there's that, that thing about being on the same page about it and that the parents being in agreement and being able to counterbalance. So there's a three-way discussion, not just two against one or one against one. So okay. I'd be interested to hear you guys address either your situation about that or just in general. I'll, I'll speak to that in 30 seconds. Parents are not on the same page, haven't been for a long time. The reason is that mothers feel it's their responsibility to very much produce the child in a way. In fact, they are so afraid of dad coming in and drawing any boundary that, and I don't know, I mean, just a dad coming in the room going, put your toys away because your mother said so. Mom will come in and run interference like nobody's business. That's been going on for many, many years. Don't talk to him like that. That's the old way to wait till your father gets home. Well, you know, the way till your father gets home wasn't wasn't so much that mom can handle it and i you know that example always comes up but it was really just we're going to let you know buddy that where you're where you're concerned we're on the same page that was to the kid's benefit a kid can relax when he knows wow i'm i'm, I'm my parents are on the same page i don't have I mean, it's not my responsibility to figure out how to play one against the other that dog don't that's fight. correct that's correct that's exactly correct so but it's again it's that women feel this there, so I was that way. I'll tell you something. I used to laminate things for my husband to read, to, you know, when our, the kids were little. And when he would talk to my older son a certain way, Dina, I know you know what I'm talking about. When he would talk to my son a certain way, I would just be so anxious. I mean, if I would, you know, don't talk to him like that. Really, he needs, you're not sensitive to his feelings. Well, my husband no. wasn't always sensitive to mine. So. I don't have. You, I, lam you laminated? <laughs> I did. I, I, I'm, I'm telling you, I, listen, I'm in like, case it, in case it, in case it fell in the pool. <laughs> no, what I mean, well, my, listen, most people read stuff in the bathroom. So, oh, okay. I, 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 I laminate. Yeah. <laughs> I, you know what it is? I'm like a drunk to another drunk. I'm the parent who's been there, done that. Right. Okay. Mm -hmm. 
So I'm happy to help you. Go ahead. So I, don't, <laughs> I, don't have, I don't have that problem. Um, I always knew that if I was going to have a family, if I was going to have a child, that I wanted to have a partner that we work together, we're on the same page. Um, I want, you know, my husband, he had three, he has three older kids. So he had a lot of experience coming into the situation already, which I love. Um, we always kind of band together. My son is definitely like can be just completely stubborn. And I will, I have to call in my husband as like uh, reinforcements or whatever. If he's not listening to me, I have, to, and we both have to stand there and we both have to let him know like, this is, we're a united front. And you need to do what we're asking you to do. Despite all of that, I still feel like the onus falls on me to raise my child. That like, whatever, however he turns out, that's everyone's going to look to me to like either blame me or praise me. Like no one is going to care what dad, what dad did and what was his level of participation. Why? I'm going to be the one judge. That's just how I feel like the cultural standards are um, still for women to be in charge of everything that has to do with the child. But, but you have to realize that Ryder is going to be whoever he wants to be. Of course, of course. And I want him to, yeah. I want him to be exactly whatever makes him happy. And I, you know, that's why I always step mm -hmm. back and try to let him, let his own personality flourish. But at the same time, in the back of my mind, I'm always thinking, whatever happens to him, it's, it's going to be like my um, legacy, right? It's mm. going to be like, mom is what, like, the person that shaped this human being into what he ultimately. Yeah, and um, I think people, you know, people like Jamie who have three children can tell you, they can testify, I, they both had me and Sarah as their parents. And they are three very different people. Like, you know, you've got Ryder. So Jamie, go ahead and tell her that mm -hmm. you don't have as much control as you think you do. <laughs> <laughs> They're just gonna just do whatever they want to and be whoever they want to be. And that is how they're gonna be happy. Uh, that is how you, as a parent, have to resist resign yourself, not even resign yourself, but accelerate your, your consciousness into the fact that that's how they make you happy. Is but by you, being happy. Jamie, do you that's, look at your kids and sometimes say like, I can't even believe that you guys have the same parents. You're so different. Yeah. They're very, very different. It, it's, yeah. it's amazing. It must be really interesting to have like multiple kids because then you can like prepare yeah. them all. Well, my husband has three older kids that I guess technically I'm their stepmom, although I've never like kind of taken that role in their life. Um, and they're completely different. They're all three, like they couldn't be more different. And right, we're going to were... go to James because he's in a car driving. Sorry to interrupt you, Dina. No but problem. I just want to make sure that we still have James and that he's I'm here. here. All Thanks. right. Have you been listening to the conversation? Yeah, uh, it's, it's been a delightful one. Hey, everybody. <laughs> Oh, this is like car uh, this is like carpool karaoke now. <laughs> that's that's right. Hey, you Hi, never know when we're gonna bust in the song. Yeah, say sing some Lady Gaga or something. <laughs> we we could. Um, I, I guess um, a, a couple of anecdotes uh, in listening to to everybody, um, just from my own uh, personal perspective. So I'm I'm obviously a parent of two. They're both in the car. They're six and eight. Um, I'm, I'm also a teacher. Uh, I teach um, high school economics. Um, and so I, I see kind of the spectrum from very young to, you know, very recent graduates and some of the things that I, I see kids, kids lacking. And I, I hear a lot of, um, I really appreciated Coach K's uh, bit about kids are, at least in this day and age, seem to be purely consumers. Um, one of the things that my wife and I struggle with as educators um, is infusing young people with a sense of purpose um, and accountability, you know, doing a task, not for an A, uh, but, but to garner a skill um, infuses you with a self of a sense of self, um, a sense of ability, a sense of humility, as far as what you can do well and what you can't do well. Um, 
and it kind of prepares you to to be a well-balanced adult that's willing to work with both the good and the bad in your own life as far as what you can do and 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 grow um we've been really fortunate this quarantine um as high school teachers my wife and i our attitude has been how can we make uh because you know students have six seven eight classes as simplistic as possible for them to get the content they need and grow in the way they need in our little niche um without over being you know uh overbearing as far as you know assignment load or whatever i think what i've seen and i'm certain my wife would agree with me sky she's right here um is uh elementary school teachers and i think parents uh for students in elementary or middle school um have been completely uh, for lack of better words waterboarded by uh the very sincere attempt to give them all this stuff to do and it's kind of compounded the stress that parents feel at this time um, in addition to working full-time jobs. Um, so what our approach has been, which is, which is maybe, uh, maybe I'm a heretic for saying this, is if there were assignments, if there were things that, that I thought were frivolous for, for my kids to do, um, you know, I, I dared, you know, I, I, we just didn't do them. Um, really for me, uh, teaching my son, especially my six-year-old, um, how to be comfortable working on on learning in his own way, uh, whether it be arithmetic or literacy, um, and like science. I mean, I think a couple of you pointed out, you just go outside, you know, you're going to find a tree with a squirrel in it. And then a whole conversation about science can, can spawn off. It doesn't. It doesn't what? <laughs> oh, it's well said. You right. can't leave then. Bro, he's he's driving. And uh, science, this, science this is, interfered with this. Wait, this is how they get you to subscribe. If you want to hear the end of this, now you got to go past the paywall. All right, go ahead, go ahead and jump in there, Kate. How's how's James doing? Oh my gosh, you know he's yeah, he's relaxed. I mean, really, oh, he's, he's, that's the he, there he is. There he is. Listen to me. Am I back? I, I, I'm going to try and wrap this up because I. I've, I've, y'all have brought up so many good points and I was trying to think of one concise thing to say or ask. Um, I guess what I, what I'm getting at is, um, as, as parents and as teachers, understanding your purpose and, and where you're like, you, and we just talked about this, like my kids are not me and they're not my wife. And we're trying to, we're trying to foster people that are going to be um, well-adjusted adults that'll, that'll contribute to society. Um, mm -hmm. And you don't need to put so much pressure on yourself except to be present and to think about what it is they need in that moment because they're experiencing growth whether you want, no matter how much you want to control it, all the time. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, so I, we've, simple, we've, 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 we've been super simplistic in just being present, be off your technology, Questions will arise. They'll hear things, and they'll ask uncomfortable questions. Um, that presence and sim that simplicity of presence and consistency in that presence has been what I think has made our experience of quarantine really, really enjoyable. I think we've all grown from it. Do do teachers' kids make better students? Oh, you know that's that's a great question. Um, that, uh, what I find anecdotally is that it goes one of two ways. Uh, they they either because um, in any profession, uh, you guys are all. Um, far more tenured than I in your respective professions, but. That means older. <laughs> I, was, I was being very political there. Uh, <laughs> He's looking at you and me, Danny. Yeah, really. <laughs> I, feel, I feel really tenured today. I'm, I'm trying to, I'm playing up. Um, I feel so tenured, I need a nap. <laughs> <laughs> I had a great one today, well, driving through New Mexico. Um, it goes, it goes, it seems to go one of two ways. Um, you know, I, they're either feeling really entitled, like my mom's a teacher or my father's a teacher. And, you know, you, you don't know what you're doing or, or, or they tend to be really, really diligent, really hardworking, really open-minded, just delightful kiddos. Um, mo mostly the latter. Mm -hmm. Do you have, do you or Sky have any kind of like little problem areas that you would just love to run by, by coach K while you've got her here? Sure. Sure. So, so uh, speaking of having, uh, you know, a couple of kids, my daughter and is, is that kind of type A, I love school. I love the structure. So the first couple of months, what we had to do as far as a balancing act is we were trying to figure out how to keep it simple and, and meaningful and, and as relaxed as possible. 
um, but giving her something to, to, you know, get traction with life. My son, on the other hand, um, I think it was like week two, because uh, our last, we had spring break early, and that was effectively our last teaching day in office was March 6th. Mm. And, um, oh. oh, yeah, we've been at this a while. So I think wow. it was like two weeks into it. My son goes, I love this new life we're in. <laughs> and, and he's much, he, he, he finds ways to keep himself busy. So I guess my question to, to Coach K uh, and, and really the panel would be, you know, what are ways you have multiple kids um, and a career to balance? What, what, in, in layman's terms, what are the three most effective things you could do from day to day just to keep yourself grounded and moving forward in their growth? I think you probably hit on a few of them, but maybe, maybe we can just recapture that. To keep them grounded and moving forward in their growth. Yeah, just as just as um, just as young people growing up. You know, you don't I don't have the signposts of school. I think what James is saying is like, yes, well, you don't have the signposts of school, mm -hmm. the curriculum that they're navigating. It's mm -hmm. it's all. Even though we're trying to be chill about this, it's yeah. still that James and Sky are getting like it's all on us here. You know, the number one thing I would tell parents first and foremost is have them read books. Every book you have, turn off the electronics. That takes courage for parents today to do that. Mm -hmm. And, you know, kids love to ask questions about their parents. Do you remember that? Like they, Jamie, I bet you remember that, that they want to know about your life. And I think it's the best time is around the table with a meal and parents have to turn off their devices. You know, it really does. It starts with you, mom and dad, turning it off. And I, I know that you're, James, I don't even, I don't think for a moment that you are, you and your, I know you and Sky are not going to hold on. Let me just see if I have a Facebook like, I know you're not doing that. So, but parents have to, have to really make a concerted effort to turn off the devices and allow those conversations to happen. You know, when they say, I want quality time. Well, how do you know when quality time is going to show up? <laughs> so, you know, I, so I'd say that, and, and I think that chores, you know, daily consistent chores that you do with your kids. And, and if you don't have any time, give them doable things that are simple and just acknowledge them, you know, for that. But I really think, and or pr projects, we have, we're gonna plant a garden. Projects are great. You're a teacher, you know all that stuff. So, you know, that's, I hope that helps you. Somehow. I think one, one, one little tip, because it's, it's easy, but it's profound is um, eye contact. I, you know, I think parents are busy and, ki and kids are busy and you go through your day and you're tossing off remarks and like where's where's my socks and you're, you know you're running past each other but like meaningful eye contact we are a shared moment where you know you look at your child and you both find the same thing amusing or you both find the same person you know that you see in public you know a, a, you know a little aggravating or whatever just sh a shared moment where let's find your socks together <laughs> I, don't, I, don't, I don't mean that danny i just mean <laughs> Let's not, even husbands and wives, <laughs> let's not forget to look at each other. Yeah, it's very important. And James, I, you have two, two kids now, two children? Yes, sir. Yeah. That's great. Well, uh, with, with, with two kids, you can uh, work a man-to-man -man defense. But if you have another kid, uh, you're going to have to go to a zone defense. Yeah, it's got to go zone. <laughs> <laughs> Duly noted. Becomes, I, I had three kids, and we were, financially, we were not uh, – uh, as well off as we would have liked to have been. And I, I called all three of them into the room one day and I, I said, uh, we're going to have to tighten our belts. Uh, you kids are going to have to just uh, you know, remember, you know, and think about every cent that you spend because, uh, uh, you know, things, things are tight. And uh, actually, uh, we're going to have to let one of you go. <laughs> Jamie, Jamie, I thought you were, we're sending one of you down to the minors. <laughs> it was a seminal, no, it was a seminal day. Yeah. In, um, in experience. No, it yeah. wasn't going to be a sports uh, metaphor. And I'm doing, by the way, I'm not, I'm, since the quarantine, I'm, I'm only doing inside jokes. <laughs> oh, gee. Uh, uh, Louise? Yeah. Because well, you're would inside. It be, would it be all right if I responded to something Dina said and something that Jamie had said? Yes. I just please. want to put these two together. Dina was so honest. I want to thank you because this is every, from every mom, when I ask them, do you feel like it's all on you? They do. <laughs> and I know, I believe that James could chime in on this because being a teacher, they hear from parents all the time. You know, they, I know that parents put it on the teacher 
jobs that parents should be doing at home sometimes that they want the teacher to be doing can you fix this and solve this and he can you know res, you know speak to that and i something that you know dina's saying it's i believe it's a reflection of me that they're going to judge me they're going to look and say you did a good job your kid got into a good school he didn't get into a good, good school you know he's at usc or he's you know um picking up trash which is a perfectly noble profession by the way and i think that this is the anxiety and why Dina is paralyzed at times to do anything. Because she speaks for every mom out there, I have to say, at least the ones that reach out to me. And it's easy to say to her, don't think that way, but it's been so embedded for so long and it does take practice. To, and what Jamie, had, what, what Jamie had said is, you know, they have minds of their own. So no matter what you do, you can put all of your focus on achievement and you can have a kid turn around and just go, I want to work on cars. And mm -hmm. the best thing you can best thing you can do is say, how can I support you to work on cars? <laughs> and, fix fix you know, ours. Exactly. And you and you can have a kid where you are you do it all wrong, you were never there, and they turn around and they end up, you know, they end up uh, tr you know, try change their, you know, doing Mother Teresa's work in the world, you know, that kind of work. Noble, you know what? I, Anyway, I'm not always a wordsmith. Thanks for bearing with me. But I, that's what I, I wanted to say that those, that's really what's happening, Dina. So, you know. so I have a question for you, Coach K. How much yes. of what you do and your, the philosophy of parenting that, that you have cultivated um, are, were in, uh, impacted by the way that your parents raised you? Oh, my gosh. Yeah. Um, well, <laughs> I, you know... I would have loved to have received a little more um, support in terms of, oh gosh, I hate, this is like now the spotlight's on me. My parents were fantastic, wonderful, loving, they're a loving household, which I think most of us can say. I think that sometimes I was criticized and, and, I, and you know, that's the stuff I think that sticks. You know, that parents can, you know, you hear that, you know, we want our kids to be better people. And when you have that anxiety going through you, especially with today's moms, that it all is on me, that we can be really critical. And we don't, we don't uh, check in to see how are they receiving that. And sometimes every, it's a self-fulfilling prophecy. You know, if you tell your kid, you're never going to get, you're never going to get into, if you don't do this, you're never going to get into that school. And all they hear is you're t sending them a message that they're not capable. So I think where I'm really passionate in my coaching is sometimes I have some chop chop parents that are like, get it done, move here, we're on a schedule. And I say, no, just like you were saying, Louise, you know, just be present with your kid and look at, remember what it was like to be a kid, you know, and, and educate them in the way that they need, that they need to be educated. We have oh. to raise them up, but we have to recognize who they are. And as Jamie said, they have minds of their own and you have to see who they are. How, yeah, like, how many kids how many kids were in your family 20 no i had th there were three kids in my there were three <laughs> came from a very mormon yeah, no, yeah. there were three kids in my in my yeah. house i went to school in jonestown yeah. that's right you know so, james you know. said james said sky and i <laughs> recognize that our our children are their own people and you know and i think you, you can see their young very young parents i think you come to that after discussing it and saying Okay, so the natural instinct is that it feels like they're an extension of us and that the way the world views them is they view us through them. And those are yeah. all the natural reactions to suddenly being a parent and having someone walking out into the world who's your heart on the outside of your body. So I think, that, I think you're, going to, you're going to parent your kids through your own lens of what, how this person is going to be received in the world. And so your mother's thing was, you know, criticize her into not being the way I don't want her to be. Mm -hmm. And James and Sky are like reminding each other, you know, we're going to be here for our kids, but we have to constantly remind ourselves that they are their own people. They need us mm -hmm. and they rely on us. Their world revolves around us, yeah. but they are yeah. not us. I'm also getting the vibe from all of you. I'm not a parent, but, but uh, we're, I think we're, this group is kind of lucky in terms of uh, evolution, in terms of evolvement. But how many parents, I mean, do we see out in the world and stuff where literally all they're trying to do is make miniature versions of themselves? 
Oh, yeah. And, and that's and, what I'm saying. That's the instinct. And you have to evolve yeah. beyond that. And you have to, you, you know, I know that it's, Kate, you know, Coach K must, must hear a lot of this. And it just comes out between the lines where the, the person is saying, but I need her to be this way, right? How do I get her? They're asking Coach K, how do I get her to be this way? And that's not quite how it works. Am I correct in that? Well, sure. I mean, that's, that's whenever you have a lot of I there, it's more about you. <laughs> yeah. So I, I think that, you know, it is, uh, it's not so easy. You know, it's not, um, especially now, it's not, it's not so easy. So when I do have a parent say, I need them to, I, I had a parent the other day, she has a very young child. He's not paying attention and she was embarrassed in front of the teacher. And the child is not even four. And she punished the child. And this is a lo really loving mom. And I, you know, my heart broke for a moment. And I, I said, you know, I, there's no pu what punish. No, he's just a little guy. And that's your, you feel it reflects upon you again. So I, I would just, I, I, you know, I would do as James said, turn the, turn the, forget the Zoom school and just let him dig a, dig in the backyard. Go ahead. I can remember <laughs> as a little kid, I was a tomboy. And I was always out playing. And I remember my mother out loud said to me, you know, so you have a young mother. She said to me out loud, people are going to say, why is Mrs. Palanker's child so, so dirty? <laughs> and I remember thinking, that's your issue. Oh. I, I knew not to say it. I wasn't writer. Wow. But James said, well, <laughs> he knows all the participants in, in the Palanker. He knows all of us. Yeah. So... <laughs> I didn't say that out loud, but mm -hmm. that was my thought. Like, I get to be my own person in this world. They, you already know that when you're four. You already know that, but you want to please people. Yeah, that's correct. I wish I had that kind of self-worth that, that you had, that you were able you know, to go, that's your issue. I, yeah, most, I don't, most kids, I shouldn't say most, but you know, back to Jamie, they have a mind of their own. So you never know how a kid's going to take this or that. You, you can't know. Jay, Jay, Jamie, I, did you have something? Yeah, I, I, uh, I brought this up before when uh, Kate was on the show, but um, I want to remind everybody that it's important uh, to create white space in your calendar uh, when you're constantly driving your kids to uh, back, because, you know, it's going to get normal again. We're, it's going to come back. So I'm talking about maybe when this show airs. You'll be taking your kid to a ballet class, and then you then over to the tennis lesson, then over, and you're just driving him from one place to another uh, after school. And you're, you know, how well are you really getting to know them? So mm -hmm. the important thing in our family, we had this big calendar on the refrigerator, and mm -hmm. started creating white space, mm -hmm. just where we were doing nothing but being together. And it looks like James has created some white space with his family on a road yeah. trip. Now, James, when you look at, or Jamie, when you look at your three kids as adults, you know, cause it's like, all right, you know, job well done. <laughs> so you and Sarah could be like, we, we raised these people. Look at them going and doing and being people. Look at that. So I, I, I picked up the, the new uh, entertainment weekly magazine. Uh, Don't tell me the, Haley's it. It's a pride issue. And there's a big uh, article about Haley. It's really so nice. James, James, his daughter is a pop star. So he went and raised a pop star. No pressure. <laughs> uh, but how do you feel, Jamie, how do you feel about how they get along with each other? Because that's a big part of parenting too, is you want your kids to be there. James has two sisters that he's very close to. And I know that James and Skye want their kids to be close. So how do you give them enough of the love and attention they need to be able to not compete for parental love and appreciation? Well, they are all very successful people in their own right. And uh, they haven't spoken to each other or me in about 10 years. That's not true. <laughs> <laughs> you see what you did there? You see what you did? <laughs> you see what I did? It, it, it's, um, you know, it's just respect. I think it's it's learning to respect them for who they decide to be, and uh, when they show a talent for something, you want to encourage that talent. But that may not be the talent that takes them to to their dream. But your kids are each other's biggest fans, correct? I, I beg your pardon. Your your three kids 
are very close and they're each other's biggest they're fans. Best friends. They're absolutely. Oh, that's lucky you. That's yeah, lucky, lucky you. <laughs> uh, when when Haley's going through something on the road, she'll call Elise and talk to her. My two daughters. I can't get Brie from room service. <laughs> long day. Fires <laughs> tomorrow. All my people. No, it it uh it, they're they're best friends. They couldn't love each other more. And this time has been difficult for us yeah. all, but also, you know, wonderful in that we've gotten to spend time on Zoom together. And that's a concentrated kind of time. We've played charades. One really? Night. <laughs> yeah, and uh, another night we had a Sunday dinner together, and then just this past Sunday we had a distance dinner in the <laughs> park, and it's uh, really great because I we have a a granddaughter who's one year old now, and uh, so she was there, and that was got to see her walk and got to hear her try to talk, and she is precious, uh, absolutely yeah. precious. James, uh, James, I'm curious, where are you actually? Where physically? Where are you? So we are, um, we stopped in Las Cruces and the accommodations were, I, I would have been perfectly comfortable, but uh, <laughs> for my wife and kids, um, I'm not so sure. So we pressed on, we're heading to Tucson outside of town. The ultimate goal is to stay away from people and see things like the Grand Canyon. Um, and, then, and then we're ultimately headed to my mother-in-law's house in Temecula, California. So I'm, oh. I'm headed out your way. Nice. Oh yeah. Come, cool. you, so where, where, do you, where do you live? Where are you coming from? So I live in the Dallas-Fort Worth area, oh. south central to both of the cities uh, in a little town called Man... Well, it's not so little. It's exploding. Um, called Mansfield. Mansfield. James, if you want to head up to Santa Barbara, we can do some backyard distance dining. I, 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 you know what? We might need to schedule that in. That would be incredible. That would be so, so... I just thought it'd be fun. He could actually be in his garage with just a virtual background going there. Telling <laughs> yeah, people... the next <laughs> thing. <laughs> right. <laughs> yeah. All right, I want to... Do we have any any closing questions for Coach K before we uh, before we close out the show? Anybody have any any unfinished business? Um, well, I kind of want to ask Coach K this question that I guess Linda had, which was interesting to me too. Why do most kids not seem phased by what's happening in the news? And she says here, I've opened conversations about COVID and the violence, and they appear as though they don't understand the magnitude. They don't understand yeah, the magnitude. It's huge. It's too big. Well, their, their brains haven't evolved to the place where they can... Their own immediate surroundings is what concerns them. You yeah. know, children in war-torn nations get it because it's about them. They hear the bombs. They, they see the bullets. They, they, it, they've experienced loss. Right now, you can't convey to a child the importance of what's happening. It's not their job to focus on the world. It's their job to create themselves. That's all right. they're capable of doing. I guess that, like, some parents, myself included, feel like it is our job to not hide what's happening from our children. Answer what is asked. That's I also think if they play video games or have seen movies, depending on the age, you can go, remember that movie so-and-so? This is kind of like that, you know, if, you, if there's a reference point. You don't have to. I mean, if you, if you remember 9-11, I mean, who had small children? I mean, you only tell them the basics. A plane flew into a building unless they ask the next question. Don't tell them. They'll find out soon enough what happened. Right. They don't need to know at five. I, I, do have a, I do have a client who was explaining to the, a teenager, 14, explaining what's going on and showed a vid, wanted to say, look what happened at the riots. Reginald Denny wanted to show, show their child. And the boy got very, very angry. But he wasn't angry about the injustice. He was angry that he was being shown that. He wasn't ready to see it. He wasn't ready to see it. So. I got to say that, that this is not that this is better to focus on how can I be a better parent in my own parenting than let me make sure my child understands things that they are not ready to understand. We are burdening them with that. And I, I, I'm saying that with every fiber in me. And, and Don't can, burden them with that. And Coach Please. K, can I also say it, it's on the Internet constantly. It's not just on TV. But right. what happened to, to, to Mr. Floyd is everywhere. I right. don't want a child looking at that. 
Well, that comes to parents being able to get some filters and they're afraid because they don't want to think they're, I don't want my child to think I don't trust him is a big thing I hear. Well, you don't trust him. Do you trust him? Can you trust yourself a lot of the time? You know, but my, I don't want him to think I don't, well, that, that's not honest. I'm just, I'm no, just ha no. I'm having a, a, a tenured right. flashback of when, <laughs> when I was uh, taken to see Diary of Anne Frank at, uh -huh. 12, at 12 or 13. You weren't Wait, Wizzy, right. Wizzy, can I jump in for a second? Sure. Uh, I'll put my video on. I, uh, I just want to say, I think I've been listening to a lot of this and I hear a lot where you people are, you guys are coming from, but I don't think we have the time or the privilege to not address this stuff happening now. Black kids have to deal with cops shooting them in the street. They don't get to decide to not hear it because their parents don't tell them. They have to deal with it. So why shouldn't we have to deal with it? Interesting point. No, wait, I'm, just, no, I, I'm sorry if I'm angry, but... No, 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 no I, I hear you. I, 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 I hear what point. you're saying, Lane, but at what age do you tell them that, that, that yeah. someone's life was snuffed out Right on a streak, uh, you know. Well, it, it, I feel I know. I hear that, and it's it's that's the tough conversation. But but we're doing it. We're right. killing these people. Our police are they killing have, these people. But the children have we, no control, and I, think I know they don't. But they're 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 part of the system. The child that's growing up now is going to be a black teenager that gets shot dead tomorrow. Right. They have to be aware of what is happening, and we have to do everything we can to make sure it doesn't happen when they're adults. All right, let me ask, let me ask uh, James. I don't know if your, your kids can hear this end of the conversation, and if uh -huh. they can, you can pass on this question, but I, I'm wondering like it, with, with a six and a four-year-old, what they know about what's going on today. So uh, let me frame it um, as a parent and then as a teacher. So Mansfield, um, just for a little historical context, a little extra flavor, is the last district in America to desegregate. Wow. Um, today, yeah, yeah, that's a, that's a badge of honor, right? Um, my student body is 40% African American, 24% Hispanic, 25% white, uh, the rest other. Um, I have, there's a large first generation African American, like their parents are actually African immigrant, immigrants. Um, being so close to South Dallas, uh, that is, think of South Central LA. Uh, it's a tough part of town. Um, most of my kids grew up well, but but as I mentioned, forty percent of them are you know young black men and women. Um, so it is imperative that whether you're white, black, blue, or brown, this is a part of a larger conversation. Especially since I'm coming from a place where institutional racism is, is, has a way way more consistent history than other parts of our country. Um, it, it really does become, I, I think, an incremental, you kind of have to scaffold it. So, um, you know, irrespective of age, there are shades of this conversation that, that I talk to my own kids about. Uh, for instance, we really got into the longstanding history of, of oppression all the way back to slavery. Um, that is something that we broached this past year. Um, I don't use... Uh, footage or adjectives or or really really colorful contemporary events to color their understanding of the situation I give them a broad framework to understand what's happening so like two nights ago I just I explained to my daughter why it would be a, a bad decision to go to the park downtown um, because of this longer standing issue um, that is a completely different conversation that I would navigate in a classroom with my seniors of, of all races. Um, I'm, I would dare say, uh, especially in a more coming from a more conservative place, I'm a little bit of a maverick and there's almost nothing off guard, like are off limits in my classroom. Um, and, and because my students understand that, um, we get into some pretty, pretty vivid, uh, conversations about race in America. Um, it, it, it's, you know, I almost, I'm almost, I almost regret not having the rest of the semester with my students mm -hmm. so I could hopefully give them something to serve as a buoy 
you know, just to see each other. Cause it's a super, it's a super diverse community that, that I serve. Um, so yeah, I, I completely understand the need for the full depth and breadth of the conversation at some point in time. Um, but I am not going to expose younger kids to the, the sheer violence and brutality of it. That'll come in time. Um, and that will be talked about. Uh, so it, it is, it's, it's a knife that you have to balance on. Right. Um, I, I, that, that wasn't, that's just my approach to it. There isn't a right of, you know, you can't mandate showing that footage to a, you know, to a 10 year old. Mm. Right. But, but at some point in time, it becomes very important for people to understand, uh, you know, what happened this decade, what's happened in previous decades, like in the nineties, what happened to Tulsa in the twenties. Um, you know, that, that it's, it's important for people to, to really grasp that history. Um, you know, whole, all of civil rights history, you know, going back, uh, be, before slavery and, uh, you know, understanding, and I like the way you put it, James, that, you know, you, you build a framework for them upon which you can, you, you can add details as, as they continue through their childhood. But I, I would just, Lane, I would, I, I would stay away from violent details with, with little kids. I don't know that that's instructional or informative. I think, I think they, can I, yeah. Lane, do you have kids? Do you have kids, I, Lane? I do not. <laughs> I remember being a kid. <laughs> that, that's a plus. So can I piggyback off this just one 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 anecdote? Because yeah. you see kids that live in a, a you know I have wonderful neighbors I have a great community to live in, um, and like there is there is very li- I, I don't see any overt racism in my neighborhood, but because of the cultural differences, kids start to pick up on things uh, as so f- that that eventually they attribute to skin color very early and i think the danger would be showing them something that explicit would cause them to attribute the worst about this group or that group um right away and and then and then the the battle to educate and inform and be proof and have greater equality might even be hindered um by giving them that raw that that raw you know chunk of information right yeah. i understand exactly what james is saying and because of what you're describing, James, my personal um, child rearing philosophy has been to teach my son about racism from a relatively young age. That's not to say that I've, you know, exposed him to violent imagery or anything, but there was a time when I had that perspective where I was like, well, he's so young and he has friends from all cultures and backgrounds and i don't want to introduce a concept to him when he like doesn't see color or whatever um but sort of like what lane was saying um there are important things that i feel like white parents have to teach their kids that black parents like have no choice but to teach their kids and when you start, I think when you start telling your kids from a young age about the history of oppression, you give them, a, like you were saying, a framework to understand the current situation, the current culture, current events, then you can kind of introduce things um, well, as it, they get it, older. One of, the bu- one of the built-in traps in that whole thing, which you're saying, I, believe, I, I agree with you, is that no, no, every parent is... is exposing their kid or teaching their kid about this based on their own set of values and their own prism. Sure. So they're all getting different stories based on what they believe and what they think the kid should believe. And so it's the, the kid ends up being a product of that. So, well, yeah. Well, my dad fought in world war II and he, he liberated camps and he saw some things that he, mine too. He was concerned that the, the world would not, believe him so he had a a brownie camera with him he documented everything and he kept those pictures on him 100 percent of the time as an adult man he did not tell us the gruesomeness of the details until we were older but we always understood about the holocaust we were always told as jews this is what can happen and but it's it's tricky because i mean and so yeah if you're raising black kids i'm sure you have to say more to them my dad was raising Jewish kids, and he felt like this is something that 
this is this was something that happened in our lifetime to to Jewish people. So, yeah, I, I understand your passion, Lane. I really, really do. I think it's all of our responsibility, I, I, not just the yeah, person. I'm, yeah, I'm just, I just think we are in a very precarious place. And I mean, you know, I, I see a really big parallel between uh, the images your father got heroically on his brownie camera and the images that protesters are getting on the street. Mm -hmm. Tear gas, batons, we, they are brutalizing us, brutalizing us. They don't care anymore if you're white, if you're black, if you're Latino. If you stand up against them, you will be beaten down. That mm -hmm. is the definition of fascism. Mm -hmm. The definition of fascism we're seeing on the streets of LA. Yeah. Yes. So there's, not, there's no more time for half measures. We have to stop it now. I know, but or we're going to lose this country. I I, un, I understand. I don't think a four year old needs to know. No, and I'm not. I'm not saying that a four year old. I'm, I wouldn't advocate for showing that photo at all. I'm just saying that there there is a certain point where, the, if you have a four year old, I really feel for you right now. I feel for James right now because his kids are coming up in a very scary time. But hiding what is happening in some sense, and I think James is onto something in a really weird, real way. Is, you show, you tell them in ways they understand. You don't traumatize them, but you let them know that hey, there are really big things happening. You know, it's just like I, I had a heart surgery when I was ten. Mm -hmm. I remember my parents sitting me down and telling me that you're going to have this surgery. You could die. This could happen. But they said it in a way they didn't scare me any more than they needed to. But it was something that I was going to experience. It didn't matter if I was ten or not. I was going to have to have that surgery, yeah. right? So that's all I'm saying is I, I mean, I'm, I, I don't mean to take over the conversation, but I, no, I just, it's a really I think See, it's a that's good. fascism, what you're doing. No. <laughs> the, other thing, the other thing is that there's, um, there's news, like I'm watching the news, my husband and I are having conversations about it and my son can hear all that. So, I almost feel like it might be scarier for him to have like no context and be like, what, you know, I grew up, I don't want to like go tell you like my whole life story, but I, my first six years I spent in the former Soviet Union under um, communist, the communist regime. Huh. And I clearly remember my parents always having these conversations that seemed really scary, but that I couldn't really grasp. And it was sort of like, it was a way that, that, um, you know, the, my formative years were like frightening because of my lack of understanding. And I want my son to kind of feel like if there's something important and possibly scary going on, he has a way to make sense of it. And he knows that he can talk about it with me if he wants to. Um, before we uh, close, uh, Coach K, can you... Um give us some guidelines for, for uh, disseminating difficult information to, to uh, young kids. Well, I want to take off something Lane said. He said his parents told him that he was 10 about what could happen. You know, his parents just put it out there and that was them. That's, that was the real, that was who they were. So we're going to work as I think it was Danny also that said, it's going to go through our prism, our point of view. I think the most important thing that I would impart to parents is you're teaching your values to your kids 24 hours a day. Mm -hmm. And I think it's great. You're going to have a conversation about what's happening right now. Absolutely. Your kids don't have to understand all of that. You can impart to them that we are all the same. Whatever your values are, you can impart to them in a lot of different ways, you know, and I think that's really, really important. And I would say that the best thing you could do as a parent right now, I'm going to say it as the parent coach, while you're having those conversations about, about what's happening, what age appropriate conversations, give your kids chores because chores are about service. <laughs> it's about serving beyond yourself and humility, as, uh, as James said, that this is about how do we serve others and, and, and are there for others. And kindness. Or, you know, and we, kindness. But we, kindness, yes. World that we're, we're, people are yes. marching because others right. haven't been kind, and we need to be kind to one another. Right. You know, you just said it. What you just said, Louise, you could, how, can you go to a neighbor with a mask on 
and do something for them? Can you go to a soup kitchen with a mask on with your kids if it's appropriate? And do, what can you do to serve? And if it's with other, with, with people who are not in your circle, if you're gonna you know, go down to the, 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 the black church or this or the African-American church, my friend Dari says, I'm Belizean, so it's okay. But to serve others, to get right down there and serve others. Mm -hmm outside of you, you know, anyway, there's a lot of ways to do that. Lane makes very good points. So. I love that. I love all of you. I want to, I want to thank our guests, Catherine Salzberg, James Shanzer. Our panel is Danny Mann and Jamie Alcroft. Our producer is Dina Friedman. Our tech team is Thomas Hubble, Lane McFadden, Michael Kellop, and Francesco Demanda. Our sound mixer is John Maddox. Our webmaster is Bill Filippiak. Our theme music is the coffee song by Louise Palenker and John Maddox. I am Louise Palenker. Be well, be kind. Thank you.